ladies and gentlemen of the uh, panel. Thank you, uh, first of all, for all your service. Can everybody hear me very well so far? Um, this will be several days. Uh, there'll be a lot of uh, difficult and some emotional testimony, and I just wanted to thank you in advance for uh, the time and effort and attention you're going to put in in this case. Um, this case has a lot of moving parts, and so uh, though the judge has asked that it uh, be brief in his discussion with you, I fear that uh, I need to cover a number of things with you, so I'm going to take the time that I believe that the evidence demands to try to give you a roadmap as to what uh, I believe you will hear in terms of evidence in this case. Uh, I start with uh, what I understand Sadie Beecham will share with you. Sadie Beecham, I think, will tell you that on May 17th, 2020, she felt her life was finally about to change. Uh, she had lived with uh, she had lived um, with the defendant uh, last uh, in 2012. So this was eight years later since she had last lived with him on a regular basis. They had three children together. She will tell you that he basically came and went as he pleased. He had a different household. He did not pay her living expenses or her children's on any kind of regular basis. Sometimes he showed up on weekends, and yet he expected and anticipated that they were in a relationship and that that simply was going to be enough. In December of 2018, she didn't want to live that way anymore. And so for a variety of reasons, uh, they broke up. And so that relationship, that separate houses, you come when you want, when you mess up, you just beg me for forgiveness or do a gesture that tries to get the same situation where you're always in control was going to be over. And so for a few weeks, they didn't have any contact. And then slowly but surely, uh, the defendant wanted to have uh, visits with his kids, which of course was fine with her, and uh, he was able to get back in touch with her on a regular basis, trying to get back together with her, again trying the cycle of trying to get forgiveness and everything will change. But this time she wasn't going there. It doesn't mean she wasn't nice to him. It doesn't mean there weren't times where she tried out a kindness to explain why this relationship was not happening. It doesn't mean she you know, didn't have feelings for him in some way, shape, or form based on their history. But she was ready to move on. And by February 17th of 2020, she was on a dating site and she met somebody where she thought maybe this will go somewhere. The person she was in contact with was Rosalio Gutierrez. Now he was from Kenosha, so there was a, you know, that was a drive to sort of see what she was going to be able to make of this. But he seemed to love his kids and to have a relationship with his kids and she liked that it might go somewhere. Now this is the early weeks of this, of this maybe relationship, right? It's not exclusive. Um, and so she doesn't feel like she wants to share that yet with her 11 uh, year old who turns 12. And she certainly doesn't want to uh, share it with the defendant who is her ex. Um, she knows him and and she is right in the sense that what I'm going to talk about next in the evidence, I'm going to ask you to look for a certain pattern. I'm going to ask you to consider whether the defendant, as I outline the next grouping of incidents, is an individual who shows by each of these incidents that he is overwhelmed with jealousy. You'll hear uh, a number of communications where that is clear even from his own mouth and that he has an overwhelming need in that jealousy to be in absolute control when it comes to Satan. Each of these incidences can be characterized as a gesture where he demands control, and as he loses control, we'll talk about what the evidence shows comes next. More and more irrational each time, more and more disturbing. And then I'm gonna ask you to take a look at whether the defendant in each of these incidences shows you his determination to have absolute control by using every tool available. Using human spies, a person named Steve Lentz, he texts as a lookout for him. His own daughter, age 11 and 12, will tell you I was recruited by him as essentially a spy. And that he's willing to use electronics too. Basically every way 
you can spy on another individual. The defendant was employing in regards to Sadie Beecham. So let's talk about each of those incidences briefly. April 24th, and this is just a one month period where the defendant slowly but surely learns no matter how he imposes himself, he will not get control. And so what culminates at the end of that about a month long period is Rosalio Gutierrez no longer being alive to anybody who cares about him, to anybody who knows him. So I start with April 24th. The defendant has his three children with Sadie at his house. So he has his 11-year-old daughter whose birthday is going to be the next day and his two four-year-old twins at his home. As he is the only adult there. Sadie does not have the kids on that day. So what Sadie does is invites her new relationship, Rosalio, to come over to her home. She has no children there. She's a consenting adult whose children are at their father's. She invites Rosalio to her home. In the middle of the night, she's awoken. She's awoken because her doorbell rings. She looks out and she sees a vehicle that looks like a vehicle that the defendant owns squealing away. The next day, Rosalio and her discover that Rosalio's truck has been entered. A letter has been taken from that truck as well as his car registration, a registration that has the, uh, uh, his uh, stepfather's name signed on it as the person who signed, I believe, the title, the registration. That's missing from Rosalio's truck that was parked at Sadie's home. The 11-year-old daughter then by, by the time police talk to her, she is 12, says that in the middle of the night, she went with her father to the home of her mother, who she normally lives with, Sadie, that her father peeks in the windows at that location. The daughter says the two, the, the two twins, age four, are left at his house unsupervised. She actually says, I didn't feel that was safe. She says, her father, the defendant, gets the paperwork out of this person's truck. She says her father, the defendant, takes a listening device and puts it in a vent uh, at her mother's home. He said, she says that he summons her over and she is encouraged to look inside the window of her mother's home. And at that time, she sees her mother and a person she's never met, she hasn't seen before, who she now believes to be Rosalio, in that, I, I believe, living room of her house through the window. Her father's instructions are, be sure you don't steam the window up because they might be able to see it. This is the middle of the night for an 11 year old girl the day before her birthday. When a rational mind might be making sure everybody had a really good night's sleep, anticipating a party or a celebration the next day, this is how the defendant chooses to conduct himself. He admits to law enforcement that he had a premonition that something was going on over there and not only does he admit he went there but he admits that he encouraged or or helped his daughter look in that window he denies that he put a listening device in he denies he left the four-year-old twins behind he says he brought them along in the middle of the night rang the doorbell needing to show in a gesture, I'm still in control. You'll hear that in the defendant's phone when law enforcement uh, apprehend him, uh, in his phone, 
they find a, 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 a screenshot that has a section of the registration of Rosalio Gutierrez on it. It has the signature section for the person who is Rosalio Gutierrez's stepfather. And in handwriting, which the daughter will, write, will tell you is my father's handwriting, it has Rosalio Gutierrez's home Kenosha address written down. Now the event I've told you about on April 24th occurs at Sadie's home. The defendant, of course, knows Sadie's home, right? He's been there in the context of the children, etc. This is new. This is information about Rosalio Gutierrez's home. You'll hear Sadie Beecham indicate that also during this time period in April, she finds to have a phone she didn't know that he, she had. She looks in the phone. She discovers and knows that it's uh, the defendant, a, a one of the multiple phones the defendant utilizes. And you'll hear uh, both Sadie and describe multiple phones. The defendant has a phone that he uses primarily, but he has a, a couple of other phones, one in particular used to record. Um, she's looking at one of those phones and she sees the defendant has ordered two tracking devices from Amazon. They are auto tracking devices devices you attach to a vehicle, and that are voice-activated recorders as well. So they have dual purpose for spying missions. Electronics to help you spy. So by now, Sadie has heard from her daughter that there was this invasion of her privacy on April 24th. She knows trackers have been purchased uh, by the defendant. She knows through a number of texts, how jealous and irrational he is regarding her beginnings of a new relationship. He is describing Rosalio Gutierrez as beaner, booger, using all sorts of abusive names and terminology for him. On May 8th, Sadie again does not have the children with her, and she is going to Rosalio's home. And based on the suspicions of what I've talked about that have occurred in the last couple weeks, she thinks to herself at some point, you know what? He's probably tracking me. And so she searches her car and she finds hidden under the car seat of one of the twins a phone that she knows belongs to the defendant and it's on meaning it would track her location. On May 8th, she drives to Kenosha. She turns that phone off. There's then a controversy between her and the defendant where he says, well, I just lost that phone. That phone must have toppled out of my pocket uh, when I was uh, taking, when I was uh, working the car seat for one of the twins. Well, we know from looking at the electronics that he was using that phone and using an app he had just loaded on his phone recently, Find My Phone, to track her that very day. And so the things he told her about the circumstances were simply untrue. Instead, we know it was a app that he was using on that phone, connected to that phone, to figure out just where she would go on May 8th. Every time she brings this up, he acts like she's crazy. He acts like all the facts are false. But when you go into the electronics, when you go into his actual phone or computer, when you talk to Olivia, all the things she suspected and thought are actually true. The defendant is again and again fundamentally dishonest with her, uh, acting as if these are all in her head or are accidents. Let's talk about the continuing escalation that this pattern that I've described shows. On May 13th, Sadie again does not have the children. Again as a consulting adult, she decides to go down to visit Rosalio at his home address in Kenosha. Now I want you to understand what we've talked about. April 24th, May 8th, and now May 13th. Because we are talking about just weeks 
just days before Rosalio Gutierrez at this same location is never again seen for, by those who love him, is essentially dead to those who love him. So now May 13th, we're four days away from that fateful day. On May 13th, Sadie goes down to Rosalio's. She is going down for food and to watch some movies. On the phone of the defendant, when taken into custody, on that phone, we have in the phone recordings of directions that look like GPS type directions, which direct you, they are deleted, but they are recovered we don't have every one of them, but they, the pattern of them gets you to Rosalio's address. This is the defendant's phone that is traveling per those directions that were deleted to Rosalio's home on the same date Sadie has gone down there. Now Sadie is in Rosalio's home, and I want you to picture this, that this is what the evidence will be. Sadie is having one of those conversations you have as you start your meal and you're sitting down to watch something on TV. Rosalio says something specific to her about, do you want to watch this or something else? Conversations that many of you have had hundreds of times in your life as you begin to start your meal. Suddenly, right after it comes from the lips of Rosalio, Rosalio Gutierrez, she receives a text on her phone. The text is from the defendant. And the text is an exact quote of what Rosalio just said to her. It's an exact quote that he's just texted her. Now, he tells her later, oh, well, that's an accident. I didn't mean to text you. That was just an accident. But his phone at that moment in time is going off a Kenosha tower, not a tower by his home in the Mequon, a Kenosha tower, and it's the, it's the tower closest to where Rosalio Gutierrez lived. So not only do the directions get him there, and by the way, have him arriving at the right time, but his phone places him at that location, quoting what is being said inside Rosalio's apartment. I must be in control. Every gesture has the same pattern. I must be in control. By the next day, May 14th, we are now literally three days from Rosalio Gutierrez being dead to everyone who knows him. May 14th, the defendant now is looking for a confrontation based on his text messages to Satan. May 14th, 4.13 p.m. You want me to stop by to meet Junior tonight? 4.41 p.m., half hour later. Still not off this topic. So, you're saying I can stop by and meet someone later. Now, none of Sadie's communications are inviting him over, let's make peace, let's talk, why don't you come on over, why don't you two meet. This is the defendant attempting to provoke but revealing his intentions. This is a communication suggesting I am looking for, I am looking for a confrontation. Here's what he says about the period we've talked about so far. She says, every time I and the twins come over, this is the daughter, I apologize, this is the uh, daughter, age 12. Every time we come over, he leaves and goes to follow mom. Every time we kids come over. She says to law enforcement, I am his spy about mom. I did it to please him. Here's a plan that she describes age 12 to law enforcement that the defendant has cooked up and convinced her to be ready to implement. 
a spy operation. You ready? The 12 year old says on, on an occasion where uh, I am brought over, I and the kids are brought to my dad's house because it's a visit and where I know that my mom is going over to, Ros to Rosalio's home. The plan is I will call my dad and pretend, or, I'm sorry, that my dad will drive us kids back to mom's house, which of course would be unoccupied, right? Because she would have, Sadie would have gone to Rosalio's home. So my dad will drive us back to the unoccupied house. It's important I keep a key so that I can get in even though mom's not there. I and, my, my, and the twins will go into the house and then, then I will call my dad and tell my dad, even though he's just dropped me off, hey, mom abandoned us and left us alone. This is the 12-year-old telling law enforcement that this is the plan that the defendant devised for her, his spy. And she said, at that point, my dad would report this. He would report that my mom had left us abandoned. That is the lengths that we're willing to go to get control, to end this relationship. They call it the plan. It's discussed multiple times. Now, on May 16th, 2020, one day before Rosalio Gutierrez is never again seen by those who love him, May 16th, remember I told you on May 17th how full of hope Sadie was? Well, here's why. On the 16th of May, Sadie gets a communication from Rosalio saying to her, would you like to come meet my kids? Rosalio has a boy 11 and a girl 8. They're at his house for the weekend on the 15th and 16th. And she's being invited, invited for the first time to meet his kids. And they go for ice cream. And, and I think Sadie will tell you that this is a truly meaningful moment in her life still today when she thinks about it. Those few hours she spent with those kids and Rosalia. She left for the night, she didn't spend the night. It was the last time she ever saw Rosalia Gutierrez. But it meant something to her because these are not, it's not an exclusive relationship, uh, but it felt like her hopes that this relationship was going to build and get bigger and get better and maybe be the relationship for her, it felt like this really mattered. Here's how the defendant was handling that same visit. So just in, in case you thought he was not trying to be a part of that. He is texting her, you race down to Kenosha every chance you get to lay down with some Down Syndrome Mexican version of your father. That's a text from the defendant to Sadie trying to impose himself in this real moment in her life. He's texting spy Stephen Lenz, who lives just close enough to Sadie that he can see if cars are in her driveway. So he's a good lookout, right? He's a good lookout post. This is the defendant to Stephen Lentz on May 16th, asking if she has a car in her driveway. Remember, she doesn't have the kids. So whether a car's in her driveway or not is frankly none of his business. But his spy is being employed at that moment. So on the 17th of May, that's the day after this big moment where Sadie met his kids. And Sadie has said throughout this case that it feels like 
The defendant is some way monitoring all her communications. Everything that she's communicating with, uh, with Rosalio feels like the defendant seems to somehow know it in real time. And she, no one knows how that happened. She's just, that's how it is. So at 1.52 p.m., this is literally eight hours before Rosalio Gutierrez is gone and dead to everyone who knows him. 1.52 p.m., Sadie texts Rosalio. Sadie says to him in the text, I want to be yours and get more serious with our relationship. Okay, that's how she felt after she met his kids. That's her putting herself out there, right? Not an exclusive relationship, but here it is. So there's some text back and forth. Uh, the defendant, I'm sorry, uh, Rosalio uh, calls her at 8.30 p.m. that night. This is an hour and a half before he's never seen again. And she misses that call. His last text to her is at 8.36 p.m., his phone to her phone. She never hears from him again. She tries him on the 18th of May. This is a relationship where they are, on, they are in communication in some way, shape, or form several times a day during this period of time. On the 18th, absolutely no communication from him. On the 19th in the morning, still absolutely no communication from him. And so finally, she jumps in her car and she drives the, you know, she drives from the Milwaukee area to, yeah, on that morning, what is going on? Trying to figure out what's happening. And she gets to his home in Kenosha. And she finds that the sliding door is open. You'll see in the pictures, Rosalio Gutierrez has that apartment in an apartment complex that's the bottom floor and his slider and his screen face right onto the road. So the sliding door is open, the screen is closed, and she looks in, and boy, does she see a lot of blood. And she calls 911. And at the moment she calls 911 and law enforcement gets there, there will be a number of things that law enforcement focus on in their investigation. And I'd ask you to think about these areas of focus as you think about the evidence as it comes in in this case. One area of focus is when was Rosalio Gutierrez last alive to those people who know him? The second area of investigation is who has the motive and who has any pattern of conduct where they would be a person we should look to as a person who might have finished that pattern, completed that pattern, or acted on their motive and ended Rosalio Gutierrez's life. And then the third, of course, area of investigation was where is the body of Rosalio Gutierrez? And I'm not going to belabor that in this opening. Uh, you'll hear about very substantial efforts in many jurisdictions involving many agencies to look for the body of Rosalio Gutierrez, which is never found. So. On May 19th, okay, so this is two days after Rosalio has last been heard from, at 11.07 a.m., the Kenosha Police Department is at Rosalio's address. And they find through their investigation before too long that the last person in touch with him appears to be a woman whose, name is, whose name, last name is Macias, who received a text from him at 9.27 p.m. on the 17th, okay? And then she texted him back because she arrived at a building she thought was his. Turns out she was at the wrong building, but she thought she was in his building, and she calls him and texts him multiple times over the next half hour, where are you? She'd never been here before. Are you coming out? You know, that kind of stuff. And there's never again an answer. So sometime after 9.27 PM, the state's going to suggest to you all that blood results, and Rosalio Gutierrez is no more to those who know him. They go through family and friends 
and no one has heard from him since that September, that 9.27 p.m. time on May 17th through any other me method of communication. And so law enforcement focuses on Sadie Beecham. Remember, she called 911. She's still at the scene. She is distraught. She's shaking. She's overcome. And she's really focused. Members of the jury, you'll hear the officer testify. She's really focused on getting her kids safe. She's afraid that the defendant has done this and that her kids might not be safe because of what she sees. And so she is allowed to prioritize that, and then this investigation, of course, continues. Rosalio's vehicles are still at the, at the residence. His keys are there. Uh, there is a large amount of blood all over his residence in several rooms. Uh, the outer hallway, uh, including outer hallway in a way suggests that that door opening uh, into the hallway uh, was open at a time when uh, significant bleeding happened, including sprayed blood, blood that looks like it's impact type of blood. There's blood then right inside the door, as if someone is now in the apartment and they are continuing to have some sort of intervention or attack happen where their blood is spraying. That blood is all over that now uh, closed door on that interior. It is all over the rug area there and on the walls and on the tables. It extends to the dining room table. It extends to the chairs on the dining room table. Some of it hits the laptop. Some of it is in the kitchen counter. Some of it is pooled blood uh, throughout that area where you are first in the entrance. There is a small stick of processed wood, like a baseball bat or some other hard object. It's not a log. It's not a you know, piece of cut timber. Uh, that uh, piece of wood uh, ends up having blood on it, which is found to be the blood of Rosalio Gutierrez, and hair on it as well, which is also found to be Rosalio Gutierrez. Uh, there is significant blood on the curtains, which are on the entire other end of the apartment from where that entrance to the hallway comes. There is blood on the fan. There's blood on the ceiling in multiple rooms of this apartment. There is pooled and seeped blood into the carpet in the living room on the floor area, and seeped blood, a significant quantity of seeped blood on the couch that is the primary couch in that living room. And in the middle of the area by the couch, there is a, uh, a, uh, a missing area where there's blood surrounding it, but then there's a rectangled off area that has no blood whatsoever. It's pristine, which certainly suggests to anybody who looks at it that a, an area rug, a medium sort of size area rug was there when significant bleeding happened and is now missing from that apartment. There are little splinters of wood on the couch uh, that uh, uh, are also there interspersed in the blood and interspersed in hair uh, that is uh, located, strands of hair located on that couch as well. Law enforcement tests several locations at various places. You'll hear where they tested. Each time they tested and they found that it was blood, each of those times the blood came from one individual and that was Rosalio Gutierrez. You will hear that the blood is sprayed, meaning there was impact in multiple locations and multiple different times based on uh, where the blood is located and how the blood presents or looks when law enforcement is present. Remember, present two days, about a day and a half after the event. Again, that area rug is completely missing. You'll hear that that uh, you, may, you might hear some testimony about uh, something uh, called ar arterial spray, where there's a finer, misty uh, place there, too. So 
Some of what you might hear is blunt force trauma, hard objects hitting a bleeding surface. Some areas that you might hear about are more likely or, more, or, or at least are possible areas where maybe a knife or some sharp object penetrated someone as, a force to, as opposed to blunt force. Rosalio's own phone records say that he dropped his kids off uh, because he had them that weekend. He dropped them off on the 17th, and then he went home, and he was home by 9.08 p.m., so just uh, you know, within an hour of, of when uh, he's never seen again. Opened a beer, drank a beer, I think maybe opened a second beer, was expecting this uh, Miss Macias to arrive. His TV was on, and his phone is never, it goes off uh, at 10.30 p.m. around. And that's found several days later, hidden in, a fri in his freezer. His phone and his credit cards are behind all the items in his freezer, hidden there. In the cold, the phone goes off. The last time that phone is on in any way, shape, or form is 10.30, around 10.30 p.m on the 17th. Rosalio's keys are there. His wallet uh, is, uh, has, been, uh, has ended up on the couch uh, uh, over some areas that already had blood, so it was placed there after the bleeding occurred. As I said, his credit cards were found in the apartment. There's been no evidence that his credit cards or his bank accounts or any other identifying pieces of that type have been used ever in the, in the 1,018 days since. The home, you'll see the pictures, is filled with pictures of his two children, 11 and 8. He didn't miss gymnastic events. He was an enthusiastic baseball coach for his 11-year-old. You will hear electronic media talk about his excitement and planning for his coaching of his 11-year-old that will be starting literally just days, certainly weeks. Baseball season is right around the corner, and watching his son play baseball was one of the true pleasures of his life. Two days after he is gone, he has, uh, he has in his date book, his planner, uh, that he is going to be at Camp Timberlee with his children. Uh, some of you may know that local summer camp. That's a two-day, I'm uh, sorry, that's, a, that's an experience that's supposed to occur on May 19th, just two days after this. He never arrives. He never accounts for this with his kids. Obviously, he never coaches baseball. In fact, neither of his kids who talk to him all the time, who saw him every week, who were in contact with him multiple times a week, you'll hear that his 11-year-old son spoke to him during this time period multiple times per day. And there was never another split second of communication and has not been for 1,018 days. He has missed their birthdays. He and his mother had a very close relationship, very close. And he has missed all of her important occasions in the last 1,018 days. And the kids he was so devoted for. Never, ever before missed these occasions never before ever out of touch his entire life with the people who cared about him and not a peep from him since. So I'm back to who the police should go to first. The defendant has actively admitted to Sadie that he is uh, jealous, um, that um, he has admitted to uh, uh, he has admitted to Sadie and then finally to law enforcement that he took his 11-year-old, as I mentioned, to the mom's home. He has a recording of that incident in his phone, a brief recording of that in his phone. Uh, and so law enforcement certainly focuses on the person who has documented motive and jealousy documented. All of this is interesting because it happens while the defendant according to a woman, his girlfriend, Christine Remsberg, is literally living or staying four or five nights a week at his girlfriend's home. So what I'm describing to you 
are things he is doing only when he has his kids over, if he is actually traveling around, or he is doing it despite the fact he continues to have this relationship with when she's uh, interviewed in May of 2020, she says this relationship has been going on about a year and that he spends four to five nights a week at her house. But the motive for the defendant is to end this relationship and to do anything he must to stay in control. So the defendant has his kids on this weekend of May 16th and 17th, right? This is the fateful weekend. Uh, Sadie picks those kids up in the afternoon. So in the late afternoon, he, she picks those kids up. And, uh, and the, the daughter will tell you, 12 years old, the back of the, my dad's van, my, his minivan, which he used to transport us on the afternoon of uh, the 17th, so the same day this happens, were, was normal. There were no bleach stains and no problems with the carpet in the back of his minivan when she last saw it on the afternoon of the 17th. So now the question is, what is the evidence that the defendant prepared for this attack, this murder? Well, one of the things he did was on May 15th, he took out $50,000 in cash from his account. When law enforcement gets there, he still has more than $46,000 in cash. You're gonna see pictures of the bank bag, literally all the money still uh, bound together. So he's got that, and the state will suggest to you that's in case anything goes wrong. He can make that quick run to some location to be out of, uh, out of uh, harm's way or out of uh, apprehension with that much money on hand. You'll hear uh, the daughter indicate that uh, when she left on Sunday afternoon, just hours before Rosalio Gutierrez is gone, um, that she saw rope and duct tape, new rope and new duct tape down in his basement. It was down uh, on top of a, a, essentially a wheelie, a desk chair that's down there. When law enforcement gets to this location on the 19th, there is a wheelie chair down there in the basement. The, the daughter is completely right about that, but no rope, no new rope, and no new duct tape. So the state would suggest to you uh, that is ideal stuff if you think you need to move a person bleeding, dead, if you need to uh, seal up a carpet, try to prevent as much bleeding as you possibly can from the body of the person you're removing from his own apartment. During this period of time, there is an extremely heavy rain going on in Kenosha and in the Milwaukee area. Very heavy rain. Um, and so people are not out and about, obviously, in the same way they normally would be. Another way that the defendant prepares is when we go into his multiple phones, we find that the phone he usually uses to contact people, the, con the phone that he usually uses uh, in uh, situations, is not being answered, though it is just before and just after, but not being answered from 7.30 p.m. to 11.19 p.m. Left behind the phone that had smart capabilities that would be tracked, left that behind, and so was not able to answer the, the calls and the uh, texts that come from multiple people, including his girlfriend, Christine Remsberg, who tries to contact him multiple times because she is expecting him in those evening hours to come over. She's talking about what they're gonna have for dinner. She's talking about what movie they're gonna watch. And finally, she basically, sometime before 11, 19 p.m., says, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to bed. She's expected him. And he never shows up at her house and never gives her an explanation until after he would have time to drive from his home in Mequon to Kenosha, commit this crime, and get back to the Mequon area, grab up the phone that he hasn't been answering, and now texts her and says, oh, sorry, fell asleep. Fell asleep during the exact hours that Rosalio Gutierrez is never seen again. 
and then has a very long conversation with her, like a 42-minute conversation with her from midnight to 1249, maybe trying to get back in her good graces. Because she's back with him the next night. She comes to his house for one of the very first times she's ever come to his house. She comes to his house that night, uh, the next night, and then the night after that, which is the night he's apprehended. So then I want to talk about the cover-up. Because a lot of times the way you can tell that somebody's responsible for something is their cover-up, right? That's a common way of determining somebody did something really bad. So officers get to the defendant uh, in the evening hours. Uh, and so it is, uh, it's been two full days since Rosalio Gutierrez is, uh, is gone to everyone who knows him. And uh, prior to police getting there, a close couple of buddies of Rosalio Gutierrez who have heard Rosalio Gutierrez say, hey, I've got this new woman I'm seeing, her name is Sadie, she's got a crazy ex-boyfriend and maybe even that he broke in my truck one time, right? So, so when, when Rosalio Gutierrez is missing and the, the friend group begins to understand this, Michael Campbell is the type of friend who will drive to the person's house where, uh, wh that is suspected in his mind and just go and try to confront the guy. And so he and his buddy go there to, and they beat the police there because the police are still you know, doing the police things. And they bring up, hey, our buddy Rosalio is missing. Do you know anything about this? And the defendant claims he's not his brother claims he's not uh, Zachariah Anderson. He, he claims he's his brother. He calls the cops. By then, these guys have already left. They're not trying to fight anybody or anything else. They're, they're simply trying to ask a question. This guy's clearly not going to answer their question. They leave. So he already knows by that moment that Rosalio Gutierrez, this person he's focused on, who he's been to his house, He's texted a direct quote of what he said. He's, he's done all sorts of other stuff regarding him. He's certainly communicated to Sadie many times about him. This guy's missing. When they go on the 19th and they look inside that minivan of the defendants, they find that the back is bleached. There's all sorts of bleach stains on the back carpeting. That the seats are out, just the front seats are in. And the back third of the carpeting in that van has literally been cut out. So you're down to where the electronics is exposed. You're down to the plastic flooring under. The carpeting from the minivan is missing, is cut out. Where on the 17th in the afternoon, his daughter said, yeah, it was in there. Nothing was cut out of there. And there was no bleach. Fresh smell of bleach. Carpet cut out in the last 48 hours. You'll hear that in the early morning hours on the 18th, so let's say defendant arrives back in Mequon. By 4.18 AM, he's searching for area stores by him and when they first open. So he puts in Menards, he puts in Walmart, he's going through all the basic stores. Which of them opens first is essentially his line of inquiry. And he ends up getting a Walmart, opens at 8. This search happened at 4.18 a.m. Okay, this is now about six hours after Rosalio Gutierrez is last uh, known alive. And you will decide what to make of this. The defendant arrives there just after 8, like 8.15, 8, 8.18. It's pouring rain. It's still pouring rain, just as it was the day before. Pouring rain parking lot, not many cars. He parks as far as you can humanly park that minivan from the entrance. And he walks that whole distance in, as opposed to parking in any of the probably hundreds of spots that are closer. He 
parks as far away as possible. Does he have the body still in the back of that car wrapped in that rug? He buys with cash, bleach, rubber gloves, garbage bags, shampoo, Q-tips, pays cash, leaves, and heads over to an area where he is doing home demo and rent, he's doing some demo at a lake house in the Belgium, Wisconsin area. A little more isolated locations, not his house, in case law enforcement was already looking for him, in case the body had been discovered. This is on the 18th in the morning, okay, just hours after Rosalia Gutierrez has never been seen. He's at that location, according to his phone, for three hours. And then leaves, goes to many other locations, but near that location, so with, within that immediate area, is a state park, is Lake Michigan, uh, is a number of other remote locations, and hundreds of dumpsters, right? Over the course of any area in Wisconsin, there are hundreds of dumpsters where you might put the remains of Rosalio Gutierrez. He's got a burn pit at his house that he has smoldering when the cops get there two days later. He's been operating the burn pit in the pouring rain. In it are an underwear band from, from Fruit of the Loom underwear, uh, jean buttons, steel-toed boot components. Did he burn some clothes that he might have been wearing on that day? Officers eventually get into uh, the defendant's laptop. When they get into it, they find a file that's labeled Rosalio Gutierrez Jr. So it's got his name. This is before law enforcement talks to him. I mean, you know, I'm sorry, they don't know this. They haven't been in his computer when they speak to him. But he's typed in the name, Rosalio Gutierrez Jr. In that are picture after picture screenshots of Facebook photos of Rosalio Gutierrez out socializing, but also a number of pictures of him with his kids. And we're going to show those to you to let you think about whether this is obsessive sign of dangerous behavior to have collected these kind of photos in this folder on your laptop. It's got business in, uh, info, it's got CCAP entries, it's got an electronic map that's pinned to the actual location of uh, Rosalio's home. And then in that same file, under that same label, he's got a picture of one of these trackers. Just a photo of the tracker, you know, like a screenshot, right? Auto tracker, voice activated, that spy equipment that he uh, has ordered and paid for just days before. So the defendant, when law enforcement speaks to him on May 19th, knows Rosalio Gutierrez is missing, knows they want to talk to him about the possible stalking of Rosalio Gutierrez. That's what they, talk, they tell him they're talking about. He knows what he has been doing. He knows the facts that we've described happened. There's no way the defendant does not understand how important a moment this is. Here's his chance, if he's an innocent man, right, to talk about exactly what the details are that will exonerate him. Let's clear this up. Here's what the defendant does. When asked what vehicle he drives, he wants to stick with that he drives the Audi vehicle. In actual fact, Christine Remsburg is driving the defendant's Audi around because her car's on the fritz, so he hasn't driven that car around recently much at all. In the Walmart video, for instance, on the 18th, he's driving the minivan. When he drives the kids back and forth on the 17th, he's driving the minivan. 
he decides to only share that he's driving the Audi. Why not bring up the minivan? Why not tell him right away, hey, the car I'm using is the minivan. Please go search it. Go do whatever you want. Go take a look at my minivan. Absolutely. Instead, he wants to talk about the Audi. Reluctantly indicates that the minivan is a vehicle. Oh, but you know, anybody could drive that. That's how he decides to behave, knowing how important this moment is. He, he acts to these officers, tries to give these officers the, the officers the impression he doesn't even know this Mexican guy's name. I think they call him Junior, something like that, he wants to say. Well, he's written Rosalio Gutierrez Jr. in his computer. He's told his daughter the name of Rosalio Gutierrez. There's a phone message or a phone recording that he records between him and Sadie where he finally admits, okay, I told her the name. And yet with law enforcement on the 19th, he chooses to act as if this is not even a name he knows. He says Olivia gets that from a grandma, when in fact he admits to Sadie that's not the case. He denies ever being at Rosalio's home to the officers, where we know based on the electronic evidence, both his text and his own phone, that he's there on May 13th. We know that. But he chooses to deny that he has been there. In fact, says, I don't think I've been to Kenosha. though his phone is going off a Kenosha Tower when he is directly quoting Rosalio. Then he's asked a very simple question. Again, this is the 19th. Where were you on, in the evening two days earlier? Okay, Not where were you five Wednesdays ago. Where were you in the evening two days ago? He says, uh, yeah, I was with my girlfriend, Christine Ramsberg, spent the night over there, that's where I was. Later goes off that, later changes that up a little bit, but that's what he wants to go with. When Christine Remsburg, who has been with him the last two nights after he didn't show up at her house on the date of this homicide, when she's asked that question, also during this exact same time period, where was he? She also chooses to provide him, to provide false information about his whereabouts. She says, yeah, he was with me, and that's completely false. She eventually is exposed because her sister says, uh-uh, that's not what happened. And when confronted with that, she says, okay, you're right. He wasn't at my house. So the two of them have exactly the same false information about where he was. So you are going to finally uh, hear two other important pieces of evidence from the state's perspective. One is when the crime lab examines the van in question. These are uh, people who are the experts in the state at, uh, at, at trying to figure out whether there's worthwhile evidence and then trying to do the appropriate testing of evidence having to do with DNA uh, in the state. And so the experts come and, uh, and the van is eventually brought to them and they, they go through that van uh, and they identify a particular location that is uh, near the back, so in that same one third of the minivan where the carpet has now been cut out, but it's about halfway up and it's on the plastic panel and it's just a little speck. And when the uh, two DNA uh, and crime scene analysts, when the DNA and crime scene analysts see that, uh, they both say, you know, we think that's blood. And, but it's so small that they decide, we're just gonna, that is just gonna be our observation. We're not gonna use a chemical on it. We're afraid we might not get DNA if we do that. So they observe, they believe it's blood. It is taken to the crime lab. It is tested. And based on the results, again, the analyst, Lisa Treppinger, will tell you she believes it's blood. She believes that based on the process of elimination. It's not semen. It's not, a skin, it's not skin cells. It's not saliva. 
Uh, it's not a piece of hair. And therefore, based on the content, based on what we can get uh, on the results, it is, it is blood. I believe it to be blood. She will offer that opinion to you. She'll also tell you that her test tells her that that blood is the DNA of Rosalio Gutierrez. Rosalio Gutierrez, there's no, not going to be any evidence he's ever been in this van, certainly that he's ever bled in this van, that he has anything to do with this van, and his blood, his DNA, is located on that speck amidst the area, you know, not in the same area, but in the van filled with bleach and with the cutout carpet. Cutout carpet is never found, by the way. Uh, clothes that the defendant was wearing on the 17th are never found, by the way. Then finally, you're going to hear uh, evidence of an individual, an inmate named Marquan Washington. Marquan Washington has very serious federal charges that are going on right now, and he's being housed in the Kenosha jail on those federal charges. You'll hear him say that uh, several months ago, he came forward to his attorney and told his attorney that I previously uh, roomed with, I, I shared a cell, I was a bunk mate uh, with the defendant. That when that occurred, that we bonded over some common sort of criminal activity. So, you know, we talked. Uh, and I, I'm not going to talk about the details, but that they bonded over some uh, discussions of their, uh, of their life uh, prior to this uh, date. You'll hear uh, that Marquand Washington was able, to pr was able to tell details about the case, such as when the police raided uh, the, de the defendant's residence, they found a lot of money uh, and a little bit of weed, and that uh, You'll hear Mark 1 Washington say the defendant described the house that was raided as a crappy house, but in a nice area. You'll hear Mark 1 Washington say the defendant told him uh, when talking about murder that murder takes a lot of work, that you have to figure out ways to track people and stalk them, learn their habits, learn what they are up to so that you can find your moment. He suggested trackers from Amazon would be something that would be worthwhile to consider. Marquand Washington says the defendant told him that he wrapped the body up and took it away, that he put the body in trash bags, that he made sure the trash was gone and so it will never be found. Marquand Washington will say, well, how did you lift that guy? You know, if, how did you lift him, you know, like however you got him out of there? And the defendant told him, I was working out at that point. I was so strong, adrenaline. He said, I, I was like Superman. The combination of adrenaline and my working out was what allowed him to do it solo. Marquand Washington tried to get him to tell him, well, why? What, why'd you do this? And he said he, he never really had a, a, a real answer, but that one thing that struck him that the defendant told him was, my ex was getting serious with this guy, and she was happy. He admitted, the defendant admitted to Marquand Washington, he also had a girlfriend then, though they are no longer together during the period of time that the two of them stayed together, but he provided those details. So you'll hear about the preparation. You'll hear about the act itself, You'll hear from people who love and care about Rosalio Gutierrez that he is gone. You'll hear about the physical evidence, and you'll hear about the confession made. And when you combine all of those pieces of evidence, then from the state's perspective, you will have enough evidence and will hold the defendant responsible. Thank you.